One out of every eight people will have diabetes in two decades from now. And that means 783 million patients with diabetes on the planet by the year 2045. Diabetes increases the risk of coronary disease, peripheral arterial disease, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, and chronic kidney disease. Recently, the European Society of Cardiology released guidelines specifically for managing cardiovascular disease in patients with diabetes. These guidelines are quite comprehensive, spanning 98 pages and covering more than 20 sections. To help you stay updated, I will summarize these guidelines in two episodes. So, welcome aboard. Welcome to CardioBuzz, your one-stop shop for all things cardiology. We bring you the latest news and research on heart health. So, what are we discussing today? Today, we will go through seven points. How to diagnose diabetes, how to assess the cardiovascular risk, how to reduce the cardiovascular risk, how to lower the blood sugar in cardiac patients, how to lower the blood pressure in diabetic patients, blood lipids and their therapies, antiplatelets and antithrombotic agents in patients with diabetes. Let's start by the diagnosis. It's important to screen for diabetes mellitus in all patients with cardiovascular disease because one-third of patients with acute coronary syndromes and one-third of heart failure patients will have diabetes. To diagnose diabetes, we either use the fasting blood glucose or the glycosylated hemoglobin A1c. The thresholds for diagnosing diabetes are 126 mg per deciliter fasting glucose or 6.5% hemoglobin A1c, while for prediabetes, it's 100 mg per deciliter fasting glucose and 5.7% hemoglobin A1c. If both the hemoglobin A1c and the fasting glucose levels are in the diabetes range, then it means that the person has diabetes and there's no need to repeat the tests even if the patient is asymptomatic. If the two results do not match up, then it's a good idea to repeat the test that came as diabetic. Or even better, get an oral glucose tolerance test. The oral glucose tolerance test is the most reliable way to diagnose diabetes when hemoglobin A1c and fasting blood glucose are not matching. Great! Now we have the diagnosis. The next step should be assessing the cardiovascular risk. How should we do that? Generally speaking, individuals with type 2 diabetes are two to four times more likely to develop cardiovascular disease. But how can we assess that risk at the individual patient level? Previously, we had categories of risk based on the duration of diabetes, the presence of established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and the presence of severe target organ damage. Severe target organ damage is defined as an EGFR less than 45 or an EGFR between 45 and 59 with microalbuminuria 30 to 300 milligrams per gram or proteinuria more than 300 milligrams per gram or the presence of microvascular disease in at least three different sites, nephropathy, retinopathy, and neuropathy. Patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or severe target organ damage are very high risk, but the majority of diabetic patients do not have clinical atherosclerotic disease or severe target organ damage. For those patients, we didn't have a scoring system to tell us the risk, and that was annoying because the standard European score charts also did not include patients with diabetes. Recently, the European Society of Cardiology developed the SCORE2 diabetes charts, and we can use these charts in patients more than 40 years of age with type 2 diabetes who do not have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or severe target organ damage. We can use these charts to estimate the 10-year risk of cardiovascular disease. The SCORE2 diabetes uses the age, smoking, blood pressure, cholesterol, and add to them diabetes-specific information, the age of diabetes onset, hemoglobin A1c, and EGFR. The score is calculated for the tables for men or women, then it's calibrated to four clusters of countries, low risk, moderate risk, high risk, and very high risk. Same as the SCORE tool charts. The SCORE is available as a mobile app for everyday office practice and it's very practical. Great! We have the diagnosis, the risk assessment, then how shall we reduce that risk? To do that, we need an integrated approach that combines lifestyle modification with medications. This integrated approach that targets hemoglobin A1c, cholesterol, and blood pressure can lower microvascular events and macrovascular events in some studies by 50%, gaining more than 7 years of life expectancy. However, these results were not reproducible in all the studies. Healthy lifestyle can have positive effects like maintaining a healthy weight, lowering the blood pressure, and hemoglobin A1c. But lifestyle modification alone is not always enough to decrease the risk of myocardial infarction, stroke, or death in patients with diabetes. That's kind of a surprise. But let's take the lifestyle modifications one by one. Start by weight reduction, please. Weight loss more than 5% improves glycemic control, lipid levels, and blood pressure in overweight and obese adults with type 2 diabetes. In addition to advice and counseling, we need to understand the effects of diabetes medications on body weight. Insulins, sulfonylureas, and pioglitazone decose weight gain. 
Metformin, acarbose, and DPP-4 inhibitors are weight neutral. We had medications like Orlistat, Naltrexone, Bupropion, and Fenteramine that helped weight reduction, but they didn't have favorable cardiovascular outcomes. Now we have the GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors. They can boost weight loss and they can also prevent cardiovascular events. So these two agents, especially the GLP-1 receptor agonists, should be the preferred glucose-lowering medications in overweight and obese patients with cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. If lifestyle modifications and medications fail, then bariatric surgery is indicated when the body mass index is more than 35. We have evidence that bariatric surgery can lower cardiovascular events in cardiac patients with obesity and diabetes. Okay, but you didn't mention the diet. What is the best diet for cardiovascular health in diabetic patients? The Mediterranean-style eating pattern improves glycemic control, lipids, and blood pressure, especially with olive oils or nuts then it can reduce cardiovascular events by one-third. Also, plant-based diets, high-protein diets, help in cardiovascular protection and weight loss. A reduction of salt intake can lower the blood pressure in hypertenses and in normal tenses and can reduce cardiovascular events, including mortality. As for the famous omega-3 fatty acid supplements, studies did not show cardiovascular protective effects with these supplementations in patients with type 2 diabetes. I am surprised to hear that because many people that I know like omega-3 fatty acid supplements. Then. What is the best exercise for cardiovascular health in diabetic patients? Engaging in more physical activity is cardioprotective. Even small improvements like adding just 1,000 extra steps to the daily routine can be of great value. Short bursts of activity lasting less than 10 minutes can have impact on survival. Interval endurance exercise training of more vigorous intensity like alternating between moderate to vigorous intensities has better effects on body weight, waist circumference, and glucose control compared to moderate intensity activity alone like continuous walking. Resistance exercise is recommended at least twice weekly. And before starting an exercise program in patients with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease, a formal exercise stress test should be considered. And speaking of exercise, smoke cessation comes up. Smoke cessation results in 36% reduction in mortality. If advice, encouragement, and motivation are insufficient, then drug therapies should be used early, including nicotine replacement therapies followed by bupropion. Okay. We have discussed lifestyle modifications, but we did not discuss the core thing in diabetes, and that's blood sugar. Of course, controlling blood sugar and reducing hemoglobin A1c will decrease microvascular complications like neuropathy, retinopathy, and nephropathy. But the effects on myocardial infarction, stroke, and death are vague. We had large studies that failed to show a protective effect for intensive glycemic control on macrovascular events. But a meta-analysis of all the studies, including more than 27,000 patients, showed that lowering hemoglobin A1c reduces myocardial infarction but does not reduce heart failure or stroke. Well, that seems confusing. What's the logic behind that? Well, we don't know. It could be due to the medications that we use to lower the blood sugar, and we will come to that shortly. Okay, then what is the target blood sugar for cardiac patients? We have a U-shaped relationship between the hemoglobin A1c and the clinical outcomes. So the lower hemoglobin A1c is not always better. Hypoglycemia is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events. So we have to personalize the glycemic targets, the hemoglobin A1c targets. We need to minimize hypoglycemia and limit glucose variability. For frail patients or those with short life expectancy, the target hemoglobin A1c is relaxed to less than 8.5%. While for those with longer life expectancy, the target hemoglobin A1c is less than 7%, but with avoiding hypoglycemia. Okay, understood. Then the question is which glucose-lowering medications are the best? Glucose-lowering medications are prescribed with two intentions. The two intentions run side by side and may not overlap. The first intention is to improve cardiovascular outcomes, prevent death, myocardial infarction, heart failure, and stroke. The second aim is to effectively control the blood glucose levels. And here we will discover the differences in opinions between endocrinologists and cardiologists. Cardiologists primarily focus on reducing cardiovascular risks, while endocrinologists primarily focus on lowering the blood sugar. And it might be possible that both aims may not be achieved at the same time. Okay. Take us through the different classes, and let's see how do they perform in heart protection. SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, we have overwhelming evidence of cardiovascular protection by the two classes. Six trials with SGLT2 inhibitors and five trials with GLP-1 receptor agonists showed cardiovascular protection. So these two classes are considered to reduce the cardiovascular risk regardless of the glucose control considerations and irrespective of the background therapy. 
We need to think of SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists for patients with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease, just like we do with statins, antithrombotic therapy, and renin angiotensin system blockers. This should be done regardless of the glycemic condition. In patients with type 2 diabetes without atherosclerotic disease or severe target organ damage, but with a calculated 10-year risk of cardiovascular events more than 10%, SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists are still considered to reduce the cardiovascular risk, but with a weaker recommendation. Okay, but I remember we had to start with metformin first. So what is the role of metformin now from the cardiology perspective? Yes, metformin was the preferred initial option for decades. But now looking through the evidence-based lens into cardiovascular outcomes, metformin is not the best. In a meta-analysis of 13 trials on the cardiovascular effects of metformin, including the UK PDS, cardiovascular outcomes were not significantly better with metformin. That's the reason why metformin has dropped from the top spot. But it still could be the option for type 2 diabetes patients without atherosclerotic disease or severe target organ damage who are at low or moderate risk. Okay. I doubt that endocrinologists will agree with that view on metformin. Let's go through the other classes. Yeah, for pioglitazone, we have one trial with favorable cardiovascular outcomes. So it's reasonable to consider pioglitazone to lower the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk in patients with type 2 diabetes and prevalent atherosclerotic disease. But pioglitazone enhances fluid retention, especially when given with insulin and in patients with renal dysfunction. So pioglitazone increases the risk of heart failure and must be avoided in patients at risk for heart failure. From the DPP-4 inhibitors, linagliptin was neutral on cardiovascular outcomes in two trials, while saxagliptin and alogliptin increased the risk of heart failure hospitalization. Lexicinatide and exinatide were also neutral. Glargine insulin and diglodec insulin were both neutral in patients with high cardiovascular risk. Among the sulfonylureas, glimipiride and glyclazide seem to have an acceptable cardiovascular safety profile if we avoid hypoglycemia. So. How can we best address blood glucose control according to the evidence and guidelines in cardiology? We first start by SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist. If we need more blood glucose control, then we combine both agents. If we need more control, then we add metformin. If we need further control, then here comes pioglitazone. If we need further blood sugar reduction, we can go for DPP-4 inhibitors, glimipiride or glyclazide, or insulin glargine or insulin diglodec. Of course, we cannot always go in that stepwise fashion in patients with extreme blood sugar elevation. That's why in those conditions where the hemoglobin A1c is more than 9%, an endocrinologist must be there to guide us. Okay, now let's move to other cardiovascular risk factors. What do the guidelines tell us about hypertension in patients with diabetes? Hypertension is present in 70 to 80% of patients with diabetes. That's why screening is recommended in all patients with diabetes. Even in patients with a blood pressure between 130 and 139 at the office, we must exclude masked hypertension by ambulatory or home blood pressure measurement. Okay, but I am still confused about the blood pressure targets in diabetic patients. The optimal blood pressure target in patients with diabetes is still a matter of debate and confusion. In the 2021 ESC guidelines, they recommended for diabetic patients below the age of 70 to have an office systolic blood pressure target between 120 and 130 millimeters of mercury. Low systolic blood pressure levels are acceptable if they are tolerated and they may be beneficial for stroke prevention. In patients above the age of 70 years, systolic blood pressure values less than 140 down to 130 if tolerated are acceptable. And the diastolic blood pressure target less than 80 millimeter mercury for all treated patients. How to lower the blood pressure? Lifestyle modification or drugs? Lifestyle modification works, but if the office systolic blood pressure is 140 millimeter or more, and or the diastolic blood pressure is 90 millimeters or more, then drug therapy is necessary in combination with lifestyle changes. It's recommended to start with a combination of two or more drugs at a fixed dose in a single pill. This should improve the adherence and achieve earlier control of blood pressure. As for the question of which class is better, all available blood pressure lowering drugs can be used. In a recent meta-analysis, renin angiotensin system blockers were not superior to other classes of antihypertensive drugs for reducing total or cardiovascular mortality and renal events. But still, renin angiotensin system blockers, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, have the best evidence in patients with end organ damage, like albuminuria and left ventricular hypertrophy. GLP-1 receptor agonists also lower the blood pressure, partly through losing weight, but they might increase the heart rate. SGLT2 inhibitors reduce the blood pressure and without increasing the heart rate. Good. Now let's move on to lipid management in diabetes. What are the common lipid abnormalities in diabetes? In type 2 diabetes, there's the classic triad of elevated plasma triglycerides and triglycerides-rich lipoproteins, normal to mildly elevated LDL and low HDL. In type 1 diabetes, it's different. High LDL cholesterol values are seen in patients with uncontrolled blood sugar. 
High levels of HDL cholesterol, and that's a surprise, might be pro-inflammatory and atherogenic instead of being protective. Okay, then what are the lipid targets in patients with diabetes? The primary target in patients with diabetes, again, is LDL cholesterol. Less than 1.4 millimole for very high-risk patients, less than 1.8 millimole for high-risk, and less than 2.6 millimole in moderate-risk patients. The secondary target is the non-HDL cholesterol, less than 2.2 millimole in very high-risk, and less than 2.6 millimole in high cardiovascular risk. Statins are the first-line therapy because of their efficacy in preventing cardiovascular events and improving survival. High-intensity statins, rosuvastatin and torvastatin, are indicated in patients with diabetes at high risk or very high cardiovascular risk. Their beneficial effects outweigh the potential increased risk of incident diabetes, especially in older patients and in patients already at risk for developing diabetes. Adding ezetimibe to statin is recommended in patients with diabetes and recent acute coronary syndrome who are not at the target of less than 1.4 millimole with a statin alone. Ezetimibe has greater efficacy in young adults with type 1 diabetes because these patients have increased cholesterol absorption. PCSK9 inhibitors, when given alongside high-intensity statins, significantly reduce cardiac events in patients with diabetes and atherosclerotic disease enrolled in the four-year trial with evolocumab and in the Odyssey outcomes with alirocumab. Bempidoic acid, when added to statins, also reduces the LDL cholesterol and major cardiac events. Bempidoic acid also did not induce new diabetes or worsen diabetes, but it results in more gout and more gold stones. But all what we focus on is LDL cholesterol. Aren't triglycerides important at all? The effect of plasma triglycerides on atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is way less than the effect of LDL. And the effect of triglycerides is mostly mediated by the, by the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins as estimated in the non-HDL cholesterol. So we do not focus primarily on triglycerides until the levels exceed 500 mg. Then diet, fibrates, prescription omega-3 fatty acids, and treatment of the cause will help. But for levels less than 500 mg, we focus on LDL therapies first, because they can lower the triglyceride. And if the triglycerides remain elevated above 150 to 200 mg with statins, then we can add icosapent ethyl, which is preferred over the other omega-3 fatty acids because of its favorable impact on cardiovascular outcomes reported in the reduced trial, where the benefits were seen in patients with and without diabetes. Great. Now the last topic for today, antiplatelets and antithrombotics. Are patients with diabetes more likely to thrombose? Yes, patients with diabetes are more likely to develop thrombosis. Several mechanisms contribute to platelet activation and coagulation in diabetes, like endothelial dysfunction, reactive oxygen, species, inflammation, and glycation end products. Okay, so patients with diabetes benefit from aspirin for prevention. For primary prevention, it's tricky. Aspirin 75 to 100 mg may be considered in diabetes and no history of symptomatic disease or revascularization. Aspirin can prevent the first severe vascular event, but the benefit is small and comes at a cost of increased bleeding. So it comes as a class 2b but as the cardiovascular risk increases the benefit from aspirin also increases therefore the decision should be individualized okay and is it more beneficial in established disease yes of course aspirin is recommended for all patients with chronic stable disease at a dose of 75 to 100 milligrams per day which is comparable in efficacy to the 300 milligram dose would adding another antiplatelet be beneficial in diabetic patients in patients with chronic stable disease, adding ticagrelor to aspirin would increase the risk of bleeding more than any benefit, so it's not recommended as an addition to aspirin. But rivaroxaban 2.5 mg twice daily, in addition to aspirin in diabetic patients in the COMPASS trial, reduced major cardiovascular events with a slight increase in bleeding, so it can be considered in patients with diabetes, chronic coronary disease, or symptomatic peripheral arterial disease without high bleeding risk. That was for stable chronic disease. Do patients with diabetes differ when it comes to acute coronary syndrome? Yes, they do. Patients with type 2 diabetes have lower efficacy of clopidogrel because of reduced activation to the active metabolite compared to patients without diabetes. And the trials of dual antiplatelet therapy DAPT in ACS, the diabetes subgroups did better with low-dose aspirin and prasugril or tecagrelor than with aspirin and clopidogrel. So prasugril or tecagrelor are the preferred agents in patients with diabetes and ACS unless the patient is deemed at very high bleeding risk like a previous intracranial hemorrhage. But we will be discussing more on antiplatelet therapies in the coming episode. Good. So what are we going to discuss the next time? In the next episode, we will discuss the management of heart failure and diabetes, atrial fibrillation and diabetes, chronic kidney disease and diabetes, coronary disease and peripheral arterial disease in patients with diabetes. Thank you for being with us. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Cardio Buzz. If you did, give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the YouTube channel and to the podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and on Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to check out our other episodes for more information on cardiovascular health. See you in the next episode.
Vamos. Sí.